so this is me. I'm um, smiling because at that day it was sunny. It wasn't um, snowing out a workshop I was doing. I was at a balloon festival that happens every year here in Vermont. And I'm showing you this because often when we do webinars, we can't see each other and it's sort of hard to picture who's behind the voice. So I wanted to make sure you had a sense of who I was. And I, the reason I do these workshops is because of the passion that I have for our sector, the nonprofit sector, for public education. And I'm a very mission-driven person. And so what I'm going to try to do is um, direct my information to those of you who work with mission-minded people who are focused on growing the nonprofit sector and growing the educational community. The other two things that I put on here that I'm really passionate about are inclusion, and that means engaging everyone to the fullest extent possible. And that's part of why I like using technology like this, because it's a way we can engage folks around the country, around the state, around the region. And because everybody has access to the chat, everybody can participate, sometimes in a way you might not be able to in a face-to-face -face setting. And then the last piece, which is not the least at all, is learning. I am really passionate about facilitating what I think of as a process of learning that's a lifelong process. I don't believe that change is created simply by learning something new, but I do believe that that is one of the key ingredients to create change. And I also know that when things change and we are focused on what's happening when we're in the, involved in the change process, we can learn from that process. So it's, a, it's sort of a, a, a wonderful cycle that can build upon itself. But I'm showing you this because that's where my passion comes from. Uh, for those of you who are curious about credentials, um, and when we talk later about learning styles, there's one particular learning style that definitely will care a lot more about this than maybe some of the others. Um, I have 20 plus years of nonprofit experience. I'm older than I look. And I've got 20 years of training and facilitation experience. Um, currently I work as I am the training department for a national nonprofit. I'm fortunate enough to be able to work from my home here in Vermont. And I have a background in social work and have worked with many grassroots nonprofits that are really small. So I'm used to working with organizations where you, when I say the word staff, I'm talking about both paid and unpaid staff. And I've also worked with large national organizations as well. So I, I have a sense of the, the breadth and the depth of the nonprofit sector. And because I'm so passionate about it, um, this workshop is focused on how to maximize impact with minimal resources. So that's me. And hopefully this is the workshop you were expecting. Its focus is on how to get more out of staff training. And the focus I'm taking today is looking at learning styles. And there's a particular uh, model for learning styles that I'm going to be using. So I'm going to run through the agenda really quickly so you have a sense of what's in store. And for those of you who are joining late, you'll see in the agenda I'm going to introduce things in a broad brush approach and then I'm going to get a little deeper into them. So folks who are coming in a little bit late, you'll be able to catch up on the content without me having to repeat things. So first thing we're going to do is talk about why would you care about this? Why, why bother learning about learning styles? And we're going to do a little self-assessment with that so that you can reflect on how you are most comfortable learning. And then I'm going to talk about the Kolb model, Dr. David Kolb's model of the experiential learning cycle and then the learning modes that come from that. And there are several applications for each of the learning modes. And so we're going to be spending a lot of time brainstorming those, talking about that. You'll be able to identify which learning style, the training you're already using, really plays to, and try to think about ways that you can expand your training so that it covers all the learning styles. And then we're going to definitely have room for Q&A at the end, but also throughout the whole workshop. So if you have any questions along the way, please type them into the chat. So the first thing I want to do is to get everybody involved. And this is the question I want to ask you. When you're experiencing training, when you're being trained, and it doesn't fit the way you are most comfortable learning, what do you do? How do you feel? How do you react? And please whiteboard your answers. So the question at hand is, when training doesn't fit the way I learn, I fill in the blank. So this is where you pick the third icon down the little text thing, and it will allow you to type anything you think. There you go. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people suffer through it, and there's lots of ways of doing that. Yes, rebellion. A lot of people talk about rebelling, and that could mean acting out. It could mean rolling your eyes. 
It could mean doing the daydreaming, working on other stuff, doodling. It could mean that you essentially start provoking and um, challenging whoever it is who's leading the training, pointing out what's wrong with it, that kind of thing. Um, yep, feeling like your time is being wasted, absolutely. And with nonprofits that have small budgets and small resources to work from, few staff, we really can't afford for people to be feeling that way, and we can't afford to waste our time or their time. And someone's using uh, text box. Yes, depending on my mood. So for some folks, it's it's really variable. It may be that there's something about the training that's attractive, even if the presentation style or the learning style isn't. So you can figure out how to make it work for you. And then shutting down is absolutely one of the things people do, not paying attention. Which now, if you think about how does this apply to you training someone, whether it's a paid staff person or a volunteer staff person. If you're training someone and this is what they're experiencing, <laughs> it's not going to work. So what I'm going to do now, I hope everybody had a chance. If, you, if I skip forward and you didn't have a chance, feel free to add stuff into chat. Whoops. Something's missing. Yep, okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So I'm going to ask you for a poll now. This is another way for me to get a sense of what is going on currently in your organization. So the poll questions here are what's the primary way you train staff now? So this would be if you're training volunteers, volunteers if you're training uh, paid staff, if you're training board members, if you're training um, employees, interns, students, anyone. What's the primary way that you're training them currently? And the poll is A, B, C, D, and you'll see those numbers over there. Please fill in um, your responses. And if the poll is covering under the under the participant poll, you'll see A, B, C, or D. You just click on one, and it will. So A is A is your you observe them and you give them feedback. You have a coach, someone who's by them, supporting them along the way. B is you uh, they just observe, they shadow. This is sometimes called follow Joe around. And then C would be they read things. So if you have a manual, they read the manual. If you have other materials, you give them that, they read them. And then the D is they hit the ground running. They just have you throw them in there, and they have to figure it out as they go along. And this is a really common one, and particularly in small organizations where we don't have time to spend focused on training. There's no training period. Oh, I'm realizing that my poll isn't working. There we go. There we go. Has everybody had a chance? Oh, look at that. It's evenly distributed. Yeah. So it looks like we've got only a couple people who haven't responded. So I want to give you another second or so to respond. And you'll you'll see the colors um, here on the poll are match the little diagram on the left and the little diagram on the right. And you'll see that throughout so that there's some, some consistency um, between the between the images. It's another way to reinforce. I'm not going to be talking about audio, visual, kinesthetic kind of learning styles, but that is something that I try to build in as well because some folks are going to be much more attuned to um, the visuals and making sure the visuals are integrated. And so I'm trying to do that in this one as well. So has everybody had a chance? We should close out the poll. All okay. right. Great. So we have several people. I think see in chat somebody listed several. And that's also true. Um, the reason I framed the, the question as the primary way is because I recognize that many of you may already be using multiple training styles and multiple um, learning styles are therefore given that opportunity. But it's also um, typical, in, especially in small nonprofits, that there's one primary way that staff are trained and it's the same for everyone. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it can be more effective if you engage people in four different ways of learning and four different ways of training. And it's helpful for me to see that as well. So, so why do you care about this? I'm really curious to hear when you saw this topic, um, what was it in particular that made you care about learning about this? Why do you bother learning about learning styles when you're training people? And if you put that in the chat, that would be great.
Yes, maximizing time is really critical. Being effective as po as possible is really important, particularly when, as I said, we don't have all the resources we need or would like to have. And being an effective trainer, all of the roles that we play, training is one that we may not have um, in our job title, but it's one that most of us are doing all of the time. And training happens when you don't realize it. Sometimes people are going to watch what you're doing, and that's how they learn. And therefore, if you're conscious of that, you can build in things while you're doing that. Um, meeting the learner's needs and being a more effective trainer go hand in hand. You're going to have different kinds of volunteers and different kinds of paid staff, different kinds of learners in every group, and you're not necessarily going to be able to figure out who they are. So it's really important to make sure that you're aware of all the different learning styles and try to teach and train in ways that all of those learning styles will be most comfortable because that will engage everyone. And then you don't have to worry about assessing someone in advance. And respecting the time, that's absolutely right. One of the things that's um, interesting is sometimes people want to know, well, what learning style am I? Or what learning style is this person that I'm training? Because then I can gear my training towards that learning style. And what's really important to keep in mind is that the research on this particular model demonstrates that if you train in just one style, people won't retain as much, even if it's their preferred style. Whereas if you couple or triple or use all four of these approaches to training, retention goes way up. And I don't just mean retention of people. I mean retention of the knowledge and the skills. So if you want to make sure that you're really not wasting their time and not wasting your time, your best bet is to try to make sure that your training experiences are appealing to all four of these different learning styles. And engagement is really critical. It's one of the things that a couple of you have talked about. It makes it more fun. And some of these learning styles will engage some people more than others. But if you cover all four, you will engage everyone. So I'm just going to briefly show you a list of things. You've talked about some of these things. Um, number one, when I asked you what it was like for you <laughs> to experience learning and training in a way that doesn't work for you, you all talked about things that were pretty negative. So if you're focusing on training to all four styles, you can reverse that. You can create a positive learning experience for everyone. And so you can avoid that kind of experience that you talked about in the beginning. I talked about retention. Performance improves too when someone is well trained. And that's one of the things that's really important. But it also makes them feel good so they're likely to stick around. So it also plays into retention in that way. And then it saves you time. It saves you money. It also saves you from losing people, which is again a savings of time and money. And then one of the ones that's sort of a more of a soft skill, soft one as opposed to the hard numbers that go along with performance and savings savings is the issue of morale. It's really critical, particularly with organizations that rely on volunteer labor, that people stay feeling connected and stay feeling engaged and stay feeling like this is a worthwhile experience for them. If their morale is up, you're much less likely to lose them. So thank you for your input on that. You guys touched on most of the main points. And now I'm going to shift and do a very quick and dirty self-assessment. This is something that um, this is not a scientific <laughs> tool. There are others that are much more complicated and elaborate on this learning model. But I'm going to use this quick and dirty one. And as I talk about each of the learning styles, I think you guys will start to see where you fit in them and what your preferences are. And as one of you, a couple of you commented in the chat, typically none of us prefer to learn in just one way. But what I'm asking for in this poll is your primary way, the, the way that you would most prefer to learn. So the scenario here is someone gives you a car that has a standard transmission. It might be that they donated it to your organization. It might be that it was a family member or friend who's leaving the country and they gave you this car. And you know how to drive, but you don't know which you don't know how to drive a stick shift. You don't know how to do that. It's something you have to learn. So to learn, which approach would you prefer? Would you prefer to have a patient instructor who sits next to you? Would you prefer to have an observer experience where you watch them? Would you prefer to be given the manual, the guide to how to write, how to drive this car? Or would you prefer someone to just give you the keys? So those are the instructions. So Karen, you're asking about clearing the list. Mary, I'm not sure what that question refers to because I'm not seeing. Oh, never mind. I got it. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <laughs> so 
If you haven't had a chance yet, please take time to fill this out. So you get you get a patient instructor, uh, get to observe someone else doing it, read the manual, or just give me the keys and I'm going to drive. And it may be that for some of you, you remember learning how to drive a stick and there was a way you were taught. What I'm asking here isn't so much how you did learn, is how would you prefer to have learned this. So it's really more about what you're comfortable with as opposed to what you actually experienced. So it'll take about 30 more seconds. And again, we're getting a, a range here, which is really common in most groups. You'll find that spread. And what's important about this to all of you as trainers is that I'm experiencing right now, I'm doing a training and you're the folks in the training, and I have four different learning styles in the, in the room. So if I were only training to one of those styles, I would be leaving a large percentage of the group out. And if I was only using two methods of training, I would only be capturing at most a little more than half of the group. So this is another way to demonstrate the importance of making sure that you're using multiple styles of training to capture the attention and facilitate actual learning for most of the people in the group. So I think I'll clear that. Um, we've got, I'm going to describe what each of these styles looks like what each of the preferences um, is called. And we're going to do this really quickly now, and then I'm going to get into each of the styles in greater depth. And please, if you have questions as they go along and describe these, please ask them in the chat. We will have time at the end for question and answer, but I want to make sure that if you have a pressing question in the moment that we can attend to that as well. So Dr. David Kolb is the originator of this particular experiential learning cycle. He was a business school instructor, and so he was teaching in a typical traditional way. He was mostly training using lectures and some case studies, but it was a primarily traditional academic environment. And some of his students really excelled in this and really seemed to appreciate it and value it. But he started getting curious about ways to more actively engage all of his students and thought, you know, I wonder wonder what's going on. And he started doing some research on the experience of learning. And what he did first before he developed learning styles theory and did research on that is he created this model that looks at the experiential learning cycle. And there are four phases of the cycle. There's concrete experience or feeling. And for those of you who picked A, the red one, that's, that tends to be this is the primary way you tend to prefer to learn. This is all about um, having a coach. And I'll get into that in a little more detail. And then the second part of the phase, that he, the cycle that he identified was the reflective observation, which is more the watching, sitting back, paying attention, looking at a demonstration. Uh, for those of you who picked B, the blue, that was, that's what reflective observation is. And then the third one is abstract conceptualization, the thinking, really analyzing, focusing on the big picture, and wanting to read the manual before you get behind the wheel. So for those of you who picked C or um, the green one, that's abstract conceptualization. And then the fourth one, the D, that's active experimentation. That, that would be give me the keys. I want to jump right in. And what he noticed is that typically when we learn things, we, we can identify times in which we go through each of these parts of the cycle. It may not be in that order, but often you'll have the experience of having an experience and then maybe you reflect on it, then you think about it, and then you, you take action. It may be that you're thrown into something and you have to take action and then you go back later and you reflect on it, you talk about it with someone, and then you really think about it and get the big picture. In both of those orders, you're getting all four of these. And it doesn't always happen in this particular order, but sometimes it does. What he started to notice was that when you made sure that someone went through this whole cycle, their retention went up and their engagement stayed higher throughout the process. So I'm going to get into a little more detail about them now. So for the first one, the, the ones, uh, those among us who wanted to have a patient instructor, uh, concrete experience. This is about having a coach. 
This is about having someone who will support you along the way. And I want to ask those of you who identify this as your preferred learning style, the give me a patient instructor, I'd like you to write just one word that captures how you feel when you have that learning experience, when you have someone who's a patient instructor coaching you along the way. Just write one word that describes that. Great. Yeah, respected, safe. And safety is a really important part of learning. There's um, other bodies of research that look at one of the most important criteria for learning, for learning for any style, is to feel safe, to create a safe container. Feeling valued, supported, understood, exactly. These are all really critical things. And, it, and what's interesting is the kinds of words that are being used um, reflect the style, which, which seems a little obvious, but, it, but it's also true that these are not the same kinds of words that someone who has a different learning style might use to describe how they feel when they're, when they're trained in the way that um, I'm describing here. So the next one is reflective observation mode, the watching, really paying attention, um, taking a step back, not throwing yourself into it, not necessarily having a dialogue, but being comfortable sitting back and taking a lot of information in. So for those of you who said you would prefer to observe, to learn to drive in this kind of situation, I'd like to ask you to put in a word that describes how you feel when you're being taught in this way. How does it feel for you when you're given the opportunity, the time, the space, the permission to sit back and just take in what's happening? The group is taking time to take it in. <laughs> I think they're observing. Yes, exactly. Uh, one of the things you'll notice in the way I present when I get into a little more depth after this first part of the wheel, um, I've structured the, the training section on each type to reflect that type's preferences. So for example, when I get to talking about reflective observation, there'll be less um, opportunity for people to actively engage in the beginning, but they'll be given that opportunity at the end. That tends to reflect the pacing that a reflective observer might appreciate. And I've done that for each of these. So sometimes there, there's sort of the, the meta happening um, in the process. So if somebody did say it was fun, and I would have to say typically for most people when they're trained in a way that's suits their style, they can have fun. They can relax. Learning is fun. And if you're being trained in a way that allows you to learn and that you feel comfortable with, you're going to have more fun. So then the C's, the folks who put C that they wanted the manual, um, this is the abstract conceptualization style. This is a group of, who tends to want to focus on the big ideas, the big picture, um, wants to see the whole thing, may even want to know how does it work? How does a, a shift car work? How, how does a clutch work? What is it, what's happening in there? And so for those of you who picked C, who said that you preferred to learn by being given the manual, I'd like you to put in a word that describes how you feel when you're given that resource to learn. Looks like we've got a hand up. Ah, somebody put in satisfied. Yes. It's really hard to feel satisfied with a learning experience if you're not getting the resources that you need. And um, with the manual, this presents a challenge to a lot of small startup organizations, particularly nonprofits, because typically you don't have a manual. Typically you don't have a lot of written materials. You aren't able to provide someone with that resource. And so that can be a real challenge for a smaller organization or an organization that it's, that's in an earlier stage of development. And I'll talk a little bit later about how you can manage that. Anyone else want to add to this one? Oh, question. So 
where the style is developed for training skills or teaching academic subjects or both. So the question is really about what settings do these apply in. When, when David Cole did his original research, he was in an academic setting, but there's been a lot of research since then conducted that looks at training adults particularly that focuses on using this learning model, this, this learning cycle, and seeing how does it play out, does it pan out, does it seem to um, make sense in other settings. And the research does indicate that it does. Um, the model I'm using is the cycle, which is these four components. It's um, a much more basic model than what he developed later, which was his learning styles. And he has a very elaborate learning styles inventory. Um, it gets into how people use two at the same time. So for example, concrete experiencers and reflective observing, if you put those two together. But for the purposes of this workshop, it's the introduction to this model. I chose to start with the basic foundation because it's one that is very useful. It can be useful pretty quickly. And it tends to be borne out. And my feeling always is with any of these self-assessments, regardless of how much research is done on them, what's what validates them is the experience of the learner. So each of you can validate this for yourself. Each of you can validate this with the people you've trained. It's only worth it if it's going to be useful in the field. And he did develop it in a classroom, and he did a lot of academic research, but then it did get taken out of there. I know it's been used in a lot of different learning organizations, corporate settings where they do adult education, um, workshop presenters, trainers, a lot of people who have focused on training and development in their, in their professional work use this model. It's something that's used in team development. There are tools that have been based on this that look at how teams work together effectively, how do they um, achieve results, how do they solve uh, conflicts and problems. And someone's saying, yeah, it's used in military leadership classes. So it's been used widely. But you're right, the, or, the, or, the origination point was in an academic setting. But luckily, it's been validated in the field. I love theory, but I also want it to be useful. So I'm always appreciative when that happens. So I'm going to move to the next and last of the four. And this is the active experimentation group. Um, so those of you who said, give me the keys. I want to jump right in. I think there were about a quarter of you who said that that was your preferred way of learning. Um, this is the, the DIY, do it myself baptism by fire group. Um, for this group of learners, what I've been doing along the way here might have been a little hard to sit through because I've been talking and I've been asking you to give input, but you haven't been running it. You haven't been trying it out yet. And so for often for this group, it's, it's a, a challenge sometimes to be in a traditional training where it's lecture, 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 or there's a video, and then you have to read something, and then someone's going to quiz you. It's much more satisfying if you're an active experimenter, if you're, allowed, if you're given a project and allowed to jump right in. Yes, yeah, somebody put trusted. That's absolutely critical. And I'm going to talk a little, bit, a little bit later about the issue of risk and the perception of risk when it comes to um, being an active experimenter and how other people might perceive you. Somebody else said empowered, connected. It's, yes, the physical skills are often where this, this comes into play. But it's also true with most things that if you're, given, if you're an active experimenter and you're given the opportunity to jump right in and do it, you're going to feel empowered. You're going to perform. You're going to learn it. And I think what's really critical for all of these things is that this is about how you learn. And for some people, you don't go and do it until you've learned it. But for other people, the way you learn it is by doing it. And so that's what's really important to understand about each of these, is that what for you might be a way to demonstrate that you've learned for someone else is the way they learn. And somebody else has added, yeah, learning from mistakes. That's really critical. For some of us, learning from mistakes is terrifying. We want to, we want to have made the mistakes in a safe place somewhere else. We want someone else to have made the mistakes so we can learn from them as opposed to us making those mistakes and then learning from those mistakes. And for some people, they feel like they don't learn unless they've had the experience of making a mistake and reflecting on it later. So now what I'm going to do is shift gears, and we're going to dive a little bit more deeply into each of these. And I'm going to start talking particularly about how do you apply this in the training that you're doing. How do you make sure that you're benefiting from what you're learning today, but that the people you're training are benefiting from your knowledge? And so I'm going to go into each of the four 
and ask for your input as well as present some information to you about each of the styles. And as I said earlier, there's a there's a meta I'm doing here. I'm going to present each of the four in a slightly different order and ask for your participation at different points. And that's reflecting the learning preferences of that style. So in this case, we're talking about the concrete experiencers. This is a group that really values having a patient instructor, a coach. Learning is seen as a partnership. What I've posted here, and if you're having trouble reading it because of the, the, the image isn't, isn't a perfect image, if you have trouble with that, just let us know and I can read those to you. But I'm assuming that most of you can see them well enough to read them. What I'm doing is giving you the self-report from a group of concrete experiencers who I've done this workshop with in a room where we've all been together. And the reason I'm presenting this first is because for concrete experiencers, learning in a team, learning in a group, learning from peers is usually really powerful and really preferred. So I'm presenting here the voices of concrete experiencers talking about how they like to learn. What is it that they appreciate about training when it's done in the way that they prefer? And you'll see here some of the things that each of you have already said. There's support, um, there's trust, there's feeling like there's ownership, it's a partnership, it's a process. All of those things tend to be really important to concrete experiencers. And then the key words to keep in mind with concrete experience um, specificity of experience is really important. So it's not just hearing the general theme or pattern. It's hearing about each case, hearing from someone about their specific experience. And hearing from someone, the key word there is people. And not just someone that you're um, hearing from, but also someone you're interacting with, your coach, your peers, someone who's a partner with you in your learning. So if you're working in a team and you're learning in the team, that tends to work really well for someone who learns best from concrete experience. And feelings, and when I say feelings, I don't just mean, oh, I'm sad, but reactions to things and patterns in those reactions and hearing about those from the people who have had the experiences that you're sharing with them. And as I said, it's an interactive process and peers, working with peers is really important. Working in teams is really important for this particular learning style. So I'm curious to hear what your ideas are about, based on that, based on what you've heard about concrete experience and concrete experiencers, or based on what you know about yourself, what ideas do you have for training concrete experiencers? What ways are you training people now that you think would appeal to a concrete experiencer? Or what ways do you think, oh, I'm going to do that now because that will appeal to a concrete experiencer? Yeah, opportunity to practice, small groups reporting back, absolutely. And that's actually the way when I do this as a face-to-face -face workshop, that's what I do is I have this, each small group based on learning style grouped together and report back. And that's something that concrete experiencers really appreciate because they're in their peer group at that point. Yeah, role plays tend to be really helpful, um, particularly if the role play isn't in uh, real time. That is, you're not um, on the phone with someone while someone's there with you. You're, you're actually role playing it in a room where you can get feedback and have someone offer you advice. Buddy system is absolutely critical. In fact, the on-the-job training mode that where some organizations are able to pair a new person with a more experienced person and have that person be the coach, that's often what happens in organizations that have those extra resources, and that works really well for concrete experiencers. Showing them that you know the topic is important, making sure that the person they're paired with knows what they're doing and that can be respected is really important as well. Anyone else want to add? There we go. Yes, here we go. This is a really important piece of feedback that if you're holding back someone who's a concrete experiencer, um, or if there's a team member who's not performing, it can be really frustrating. And that's why when I'm talking about putting uh, people into groups and teams and pairing them up when you're training them, um, it's still their individual performance that you're focusing on developing, just as you are with everyone you're training. You're really focused on their individual performance. But if you create opportunities for their, them to learn and benefit from a group experience, their, their growth will be facilitated and they may in fact train other people in the room. There are other 
concrete experiencers, that can often happen where they end up sort of training one another through their experience. So here are some other ideas, and some of these you've already said, and some of these are more concrete, specific things you can build into any training plan that you develop. Um, one of the most important things is right off the bat to welcome the concrete experiencers. Introduce them to everyone. Identify who the people are. Don't just show them a, con you know, a, a, a picture of an organizational chart, but actually take them around and have them meet people. Take them to an event where they can meet those people. Invite them to a board meeting or a program that your organization delivers. Make sure that they meet all the people who they will need to go to to get information from. And have them interview people. Give them a list of people you say, you know, it would be really great if you talk to this person and that person and ask them the questions that you might have so that they get to know people, they can connect, but they're also learning from each of those people. So you're always wanting to emphasize the connection as part of the learning. And in the buddy, we've talked about that. The time factor is really important. Make sure that you're spending time with them, that you're giving them the support that they need, or that you're making sure their buddy or their coach has the opportunity to do that. So it's better to make sure you build more of that in rather than less. Some social time is also valued as well. And then the coaching key part of that is feedback. Make sure that they're getting feedback, that they hear how they're doing, um, what they're doing that's appreciated, what's working. Ask them for their feedback. That's really important. That sometimes doesn't happen. <laughs> sometimes in training we get really focused on giving people feedback about what they're doing and we forget to ask, well, how am I doing? How is this working for you? And that's a really important question. So those are some, some ideas for concrete experiencers. And um, for those of you who haven't done this yet, please put your email address in the chat. I'm going to be sending out a handout that has a little more detail on these after the workshop. And I'm going to move to the next one, the reflective observation mode of learning. And again, I'm going to be presenting this in a way that might appeal more to that learning style. I'm going to start off by presenting more information before I ask you for your input. So with reflective observation, key things is consideration, really wanting to hear and, and get data from lots of different sources. So wanting to hear from multiple perspectives, but also you know, want to hear, see an evaluation, read the description, um, watch it in action, maybe see a video, if there's been media coverage, see that. So, so getting not just written material, but getting information from a lot of different perspectives in a lot of different places. And one thing that reflective observers may focus on more than other groups is meaning. What does this mean? What's important? What are the patterns? Looking at that. And typically, when a reflective observer will reserve judgment and won't form or offer an opinion until they've gathered a lot of information and had time to digest. So some people will think, well, this is just an introspection. This is someone who really needs to think and process before they speak. Well, it's, it's similar to that, but it, this is different because this is for, focused on how someone learns. And with learning, for some of us, we're asked to answer a question in the, in the minute, in the moment, right now, in a meeting, okay, what do you think? And for a reflective observer, that may not be a comfortable thing. They may feel like, well, I need more information. I need to think about this. I need to hear from so-and-so. And so when you're training someone like this, it's important to keep that in mind. And then lastly, time. Just take time. Don't rush the process. Make sure that the person is given the opportunity to come back and ask questions in the future, um, that they're given more than one opportunity to do that. Here's what some reflective observers have reported about themselves in a small group. Uh, here again, the meta with reflective observers is I'm still sharing information with you. I haven't yet asked you for your input. That's something that for a reflective observer would be more comfortable than it might be for some of the other styles. And also hearing from others is really important, not just from experts and not just from peers. And so I'm presenting this as a way to make sure that other reflective observers, as well as everyone on the call, is hearing from reflective observers about what works for them in terms of training. And so you'll see things here that echo what I've said already. Don't rush me. Offer explanations, Q&A, making sure that there's a lot of observation built into things and that it's an ongoing process. There's continued encouragement. And one of the things I think is really important on this one is on number one where it talks about making sure you don't get a demonstration just once. Um, for a reflective observer, the, part of the experience may be that the first time you see it, you're watching 
to get the overall. And then the second time, you're focusing on particular aspects or details where you're seeing it with greater understanding because you already have some information now and you've been able to digest. And so now you're taking your understanding and your learning to a deeper level. So for some folks, that might feel like, oh, it's repetitious. I've already seen this. But for others, that may be the way they learn. And so here are some ideas distilled from the input from reflective observers and from the research and from common sense. Um, it's really important to provide reflective observers the opportunity to take notes. Sometimes there's experiences we all have where we're, we're in a situation, we're observing it, but somehow we haven't been given a pen or we're not given an opportunity to really take notes and jot down what we think about it, particularly as soon as possible after the experience happens. Debriefing is really critical. As I said, Q&A, taking time. And then this one here is really important, providing unsolicited inf inf information. While it's important to create time for Q&A, it's also really important to make sure that you're not just waiting to hear questions, that you're providing information along the way, even if it isn't asked for. And then don't put someone in a position where they have to go solo if they don't feel ready. For an active experimenter, as I said earlier, they're going to feel ready really quickly, maybe before you feel like you've even trained them. Whereas for a reflective observer, they may not feel ready until you feel like, well, what are they waiting for? So it's important to check your reaction to someone's pace and think, you know, that might be a reflection of how they learn. Ah, yes, someone talking. <laughs> yes, compulsive note-taking colleagues. And note the word compulsive here. <laughs> Some of us will take notes about everything, and we'll take them and we'll copy them over. And we might bring our laptop to everything and want to capture everything that's said. That's how we learn. Some of us may feel like, oh, just let's get to the let's get to the action, and they get really impatient with someone who wants to slow down the process to take notes or get into the details. And that's just the way we learn. And so the balancing act in all of this is really challenging. But again, if you make sure you're covering all four when you're training people, you'll capture them in the way they prefer to be captured at least some of the time. And for everyone, the retention of knowledge will go up. So I want to ask you now, what are your ideas for training reflective observers? And it would be great, Mary, if we could do this one as a whiteboard. So I'm asking the group now what your opinions are regardless of whether you identify as a reflective observer, what ideas you would have, things you would do to train someone who's a reflective observer, and to train everyone in a way that uses this learning style. And again, in the uh, left-hand column where you see the little icons on the whiteboard, the little one that says A, that's the third one down, you can use. Perfect. Yeah, PowerPoint, visuals, yeah, the lists on flip charts like I've shown you, handouts to take notes on, yes, really critical. Journals, actual reflection, that's perfect. One of the things that you can really easily build in is just to have, send someone some reflection questions or give them some questions and tell them the next time you meet, you're going to ask for their reflections either in writing or in verbally, and, but you're giving them the time to do that. Um, someone says, need another way to ensure understanding other than a verbal response? Yes. Um, making sure that you can communicate with them by email. Um, they can send you written documents. You can give them things in writing. It's really helpful if you can to send out questions or content that's going to be discussed in advance so that they can take time to take it in and digest and think about what they want to offer. Handouts in packets, yes. Some people are going to hate that. Some people are going to love that. And training in small increments. This is important for a couple of learning styles to make sure that um, you're allowing for people to digest along the way in the case of reflective observers. Or in the case of active experimenters, active experimenters will get too impatient if you train the whole thing all at once and then stop for performance. If you do it in smaller increments, bite-sized pieces, it will work well for a couple of different learning styles. Yep, and repetition. So I've built that in throughout this training. And for some of you, that's going to feel really good. You're going to feel like, oh, I'm getting this. And for some, it's going to drive you crazy because the pace is going to be different from what you're most comfortable with. 
Okay, so there's a question in the chat about different learning. How do you explain it? I, I'm going to uh, talk about that at the end, if you don't mind, Mary, holding that question for me, reminding me that it's on the table. So great, I really appreciate all of these. These these things that you're saying are exactly spot on. But I'm going to move on now because I want to make sure to get to the other two. So ex abstract conceptualization. So this is the group when I said give me the manual. If you said that, that's abstract conceptualization. Or if you have people who ask you for the manual, that's abstract as well. Now you'll notice on this slide it's the only one that is numbered. And you'll see when I get to the self-report that that too is the only one that's numbered. Um, this is the group of learners for whom the structure is really important. Logic is really important. Making sure that step-by-step -step explanations are included, but really that it's tied to the big picture, um, that there's some sense of the system, and that the process of learning is systematic. You get models, and you focus on how things work as well as why. But it's very much about the ideas behind things, the rationale and the context. And some of the ways that training works really well for abstract conceptualizers that stems from that. Um, the big picture is really, really important. As I said, context. I talked earlier about expertise, making sure that they understand the person training them is an expert. So when I offered my credentials at the beginning of the program, that was something that might have appealed more to abstract conceptualizers than to others in the group. Um, role switch. And by this one, I mean have them train you. And this is something that we all have happened to us anyway when we've been trained on something and we have to turn around and train someone else. That's a great way for an abstract conceptualizer to learn because they may learn in the actual teaching process. And for some folks, that's not how they learn. They will not train someone until they know it cold. But for an abstract conceptualizer, often the integration of knowledge happens in the training experience. Um, analysis and research go hand in hand. Um, one of the things that you can do that really adds value to the organization is ask someone who's an abstract conceptualizer, or anyone for that matter, but ask them to analyze what's happening in a system or a process or a program of your organization. Maybe do some research about best practices or other programs or other resources or other options. Um, and then create revisions, improve the program based on their analysis and their research. This is a great way for them to learn, and it also adds value to the organization, also leads to improvement of the, pro of the programs and organizations. Oh, I see someone's asking about the percentage breakdowns of adult learning styles. I'll send out um, some information about that because the studies, as, as with all studies, um, the sample sizing and, and the, well, I'll, uh, to explain it more in more detail, the learning styles profile and inventory that Dr. Kolb developed isn't based on these four parts of the learning cycle. So the percentages for the populations that have been researched aren't tied to these four learning styles. They're tied to more, the more complicated model. And so the data I have aren't going to answer the question about how, what percentage of the population are abstract, abstract conceptualizers. So that's part of why I'm not including it in this. But what's important to know is that it's not so much about making sure that you're appealing to the dominant or the majority learning style, but that you're covering all four because that's how everybody will learn best. That's how they retain most. So let's see. Okay. So we got revisions. Now we have the self-report. And the reason I presented this later than I did with some of the others is because for abstract conceptualizers, um, hearing from their peers, while it's important, might not be as important as hearing from data research and experts. Now, self-report is a form of research, and when you aggregate the data from a lot of different self-reports, you you start to develop um, some, you know, some of the data are useful in that case. But for an abstract conceptualizer, they're more likely going to be curious about hearing what research that's been done, like some of the questions that are coming up right now. How how that what what are those data telling us? And so that's why I presented this later than I did for some of the others. You might not be able to read all of this, so I'm going to talk you through the images that are underneath each of the six points. Again, this is, one of the, this is the only group that numbered their points um, and then broke it down with um, sub, sub notations in, in the form of diagrams and models. 
um, that's that's also a way that they're expressing their learning style. So the first one, what's the point? There's you have an image of someone who's thinking. They're essentially they're thinking about the big idea. It, it looks very much like the the icon I have in the upper left of the slide. And then there's creating steps written, and you'll see again the steps are numbered one, two, three. That's very important to make sure that it's logical, that it's structured. Now, for some other learning styles, that will make them crazy, make us frustrated. But for abstract conceptualizers, it'll make them feel comfortable. It'll make us feel like we know what's happening. We know how everything fits together. And then in visuals for steps is really important. It's a way to create a model that illustrates what the key points are. Distribution is important, meaning, and this is where they got into, well, what do you do with a manual? You have the manual, it's very clear, and then you distribute it, meaning you share it with everyone so everyone has the same information and access to the same information. And then a video demonstration is really helpful as well, but notice that that comes later on the list compared to where it came for a reflective observer. And then lastly is being available for questions, which you'll notice is the last thing listed, whereas for concrete experiencers, it's typically one of the first things listed. So that's a self-report. And now I'm curious to hear what your ideas are. And again, Mary, if we could do this as a whiteboard, that would be terrific. I'm curious what you guys would add for training abstract conceptualizers. Oh, and someone's asking a question about um, learning styles relating to career choices. There is some research about that, and I, what I can do is pull some citations for that. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Myers-Briggs type indicator, but there's actually some research that looks that that tends to be focused almost exclusively in in the research, at least, on career and career choices and patterns. Um, similarly, there's been some research looking at the cold learning styles and their relationship with Myers-Briggs and how that fits together in terms of career. So I can at least send you. Um, and I'll send this to everyone, not just the person who is asking the question. I will um, send out some sites that give you an indication of what's uh, what's out there in terms of the research. And as you would guess, I mean intuitively, their patterns are if someone learns in certain ways, and the, that profession tends to train and teach in that way. It, it's a more comfortable fit. So here we have using teaching models exactly, Kolb's model. So for example, I showed the model early on. For an, for an abstract conceptualizer, that's really important to see that model, to make sure that they see that. Flow charts, logic models, some people love them. I happen to really like logic models. But other people, I show them a logic model, and they're, they roll their eyes. And they think, well, this is, this is theoretical, or this is, yeah, whatever. They don't find it very interesting. Um, but it's a way of structuring and organizing knowledge and data, and for some, just creating a logic model or an outline will facilitate the learning process. And that's what's critical here. Background information, context, really important, checklists, flowcharts. Well, you'll notice the pattern here, the trend here, is people are talking about visual aids, but they're also talking about structures that organize data and organize knowledge. And that's what's really important. Also, the bibliography. I keep saying, well, I'll send you a site for that. I typically follow up every training with some kind of bibliography that gives a lot more detail or gives puts people in the direction of finding a lot more detail. That's a way of really appealing to an abstract conceptualizer. <laughs> Mary saying she doesn't love logic models here. Well, it's funny because I'm actually not an abstract conceptualizer myself. However, I do really like logic models. I think they're really cool. And someone put colors. Yes, colors organizing. You'll see I've used color a lot here. Um, part of that just has to do with how our brains work. And um, in, in the learning education and research, looking at if you integrate images with words and you integrate color in there, it, it's going to stimulate you in a different way than if it's all you know, black and white and there's all words. You know, you've seen those PowerPoints, right, where it's all words. And that's not typically going to facilitate the learning for everyone. For some, it will be fine, but for many of us, it won't be. So now I want to ask you guys right off the bat what your ideas are for training active experimenters. And I'd like to do this one as a chat so that people can be just typing it in all at the same time if you'd like. And you'll notice with this one, someone's talking, how do you explain it? Here I, I asked you the question right off the bat. I am not telling you. Any, I'm not giving you any data, no research, no definition. I'm just telling you, okay, you've heard a little bit about active experimentation. Some of you have identified yourselves this way. 
how would you train someone who who's an active experimenter? Yeah, we got people saying just do it. <laughs> and then the question some of us will ask is, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Case studies. Um, some active experimenters will find case studies to be too slow. Um, they'll want to be able to create a case study by doing it themselves and then perhaps writing about it later, or maybe not. And we have activities hands on. Yes, that's really important. Um, setting up the demo and have them dive right in is really important. Creating challenges, absolutely. And then Mary captures it really well. Provide the problem, say what the problem is, and then get out of the way. Yeah, creating opportunities for the person to take action, to implement things, to pilot, to try things out. Um, don't show them how. Exactly. Give them. Here, say, here's what I need you to do. Go. Role playing, role playing is great, particularly if it can be in real time, meaning you're with them and you're asking them to take something on, and then you can coach them next to them, but give them the opportunity to actually do it. And on-site training is a great way to do that. Yeah, taking someone who's an active experimenter into a classroom and doing two weeks of orientation before they actually get to go to the site doesn't suit most active experimenters that well. And then this is beautiful. The one that says Deborah said, um, give basic guideline and desired end result and let them go, you're going to see in a second that's exactly what a group of active experimenters said themselves. Yeah, props are great, space to move. You guys, this is all dead on. So you could, you could teach this one. And here you see, this is the one I was just talking about. It's hard to read. At the top, a group of active experimenters created this list. You'll notice this is the shortest of the lists that I've shared with you. These lists were all from the same workshop and each of the small groups had about the same number of people. So it's not because this was a smaller group. Active experimenters listed two things. They said clear goals and expectations with deadlines and timelines, which is one of the things that Deborah identified, and then help and resources available, where, when, who. So essentially what they wanted was they wanted the end point, they wanted the goal, and they also wanted what the, what the boundaries were within reason. And then they put the Nike symbol, just do it. And it's, it's hard for some folks to understand what this experience is like. If you're not an active experimenter, this is going to feel completely unstructured. Um, you're going to be, and some of you may be thinking this, you're going to think, oh, well, how do you ensure consistency? How do you ensure quality? How do you make sure that, um, that rules aren't broken and lines crossed? Oh my God, that seems really risky. For some of us, that's going to be our reaction when we see someone who wants to learn in this way. For others, that is how we learn. We don't learn by listening to a lot of data and then taking action. Um, we want to essentially generate data ourselves. And it's really important to remember. So what I try to do is build in opportunities for all of these learning styles to be demonstrated. So for example, when we started off with you guys giving your input, that's something that appeals more to an active experimenter than me starting off with telling you what other people have said or doing this, which is sharing key words that describe active experimentation. And for some other learning styles, you're going to want to start in a different place. And so again, that presents a challenge as a trainer because you have to start in one place and continue in a certain sequence. You can't do it all at the same time, except if you start crafting experiences, learning experiences that include elements of all. So you have an hour, make sure that you include different learning experiences that involve all of these preferences. And then there are activities that can speak to more than one at a time. And so I'm going to start to wind down my overview and ask you for questions you have and ideas you have. Um, but I just want to touch on a few things that are on this slide first. Um, the, the issue of risk, I already said, the perception of risk is different for each of us. It's not just about learning style. Sometimes it's about experience and it's about point of view or level of responsibility. But it's really important to remember that for an active experimenter, they may not perceive something as a risk that you perceive as a risk. And so where you might think someone's taking risks, they might think what they're doing is learning. And so it's, that's an important thing to identify, and that's why setting what the boundaries are so that people are clear about where, when they're crossing a the line um, is really important up front. That's important for everyone because safety is an important criteria for learning for everyone regardless, regardless of learning style. And then another thing I want to say on this one too is if you're looking to pilot projects or if you have a really slim uh, resources and you need someone to kick off a project, 
if you find someone who really enjoys this kind of learning and prefers this way of operating, this might be a good person to pick to pilot a project because they're going to um, get energized by it, they'll learn, they'll keep motivated, they won't necessarily be asking for things from you that you ne can't necessarily provide. And then I'm going to ask you if there are any other things you want to add, um, having heard all that, about how you might train an active experimenter in the chat would be great. If you don't have anything you want to add on that, on active experimentation, I want to ask for your questions. Any question you have about any of this or about how you might apply any of this. There was a question back a ways, Kat, that you asked me to keep track of, which uh, I didn't, but I can go back and get. Oh, that would be great. Or if the person who asked it wants to retype it, either way, I don't care. I'm sorry, I didn't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, explain the different learning styles. Uh, oh, how you share learning styles with the audience or with your staff or your board so that they have some understanding and patience with the need to sort of hit all four of these. Right. So that I do that. It depends on how much time I have, who the audience is, what my role is, et cetera. But for example, at a workshop like this, um, up front I'll tell you I'm going, to be, I'm going to be going through four different learning styles and I'm going to do it in four different ways. And so some of you are going to be bored and some of you are going to be excited and some of you are going to feel like this doesn't speak to you and some of you are going to feel like it does. Ideally, with any training, you're aware that people are going to get turned off at any point because of various reasons. I mean, any time we design any kind of training, if it's a presentation in particular, people are going to be tuned out at different times. They're going to be more responsive, more engaged, depending on what you're doing. And that's going to happen regardless of how conscious you are of the different learning styles and how you structured it. But when you do build in and design training using all four of those learning styles, what happens is you're at least aware, even if you haven't shared with the audience, that okay, so maybe right now there's a group of people who are not as engaged. Maybe the active experimenters are, you know, doodling because what you're doing is you're talking about theory. But you know that the abstract conceptualizers in the room, and perhaps other groups as well, but they, particularly them, are going to be pretty excited and eager to learn more about the theory. So if you make sure that you do both of those things, you cover what the abstract conceptualizers want, you provide opportunity for dyads and small groups so that concrete experiencers are getting more of what they need to learn. You're providing plenty of opportunity for people not to participate until they're ready so someone who's more of an reflective observer can learn. And you also provide opportunities for people to jump in and engage. If you make sure to build all four in, you're, I mean, you're, like I said, you're always going to have people who get impatient because they want it to be over with and maybe you've hit on their learning style already. But I think what's really important in the beginning is for you to be aware and conscious that you're structuring it intentionally that way. And then if you do reveal that to the group, I think it's really important to make sure that you reveal it in a way that will be useful for them. So for some of them, you can say, depending on how informal you can be with the group, you can say, look, I know I'm going to be training for an hour on this topic and some of you are going to be interested for 20 minutes and the rest of the time you're not. And you know who you are, and that's fine. I'm going to be presenting information in a variety of different ways because I want to make sure that we all are engaged and that we all understand it. But then I think the most compelling reason to make sure that you train to all four styles is that people's retention of knowledge will go up if they learn in all four styles, regardless of which style they are. And so sometimes just letting people know, I'm going to take more time than you think might think we need because I want to make sure we don't have to repeat this or I want to make sure that you really get it. I want to make sure that everyone remembers more rather than leaving after 20 minutes presented in only one way and chances are it won't retain as much. So I don't know if that satisfactorily answers your question, but to me it really depends on the topic and the audience and my level of comfort. As a trainer, and I do a lot of training of trainers, often I, I pull back the curtain, as you say. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the structure. I'll talk about the meta because I am doing that in order to equip trainers to then be conscious when they're designing learning experiences of how to build in the learning styles as well. 
I actually have a checklist I use every time I design a training. I go and I do my instructional design process, and I make sure that I'm designing sections that are going to facilitate learning really effectively for each of the four styles. And if I can, I try to design experiences and exercises that will engage more than one style at a time. So for example, talking about theory and talking about um, Showing, so showing a demonstration where the talk is about theory will appeal to both a reflective observer as well as an abstract conceptualizer. Um, pairing people up to take action without prepping them that much, that might work for both an active experimenter and a concrete experiencer because they're working in a pair so there's support and they're being given the opportunity to jump right in and have an experience together. So there are ways that I'll do that to make sure that I'm giving everybody an opportunity. And someone's asking if I can share the checklist. Sure, for me the checklist is just I have a, a, each, each of the four styles and I lay out my design and I have each of the components of my training on the left side and then I just check off for each one which of the styles that will appeal to. And afterwards I essentially count exactly a matrix. Are you an abstract conceptualizer by any chance? <laughs> I will look at the checklist and see, okay, so it looks like this is a workshop that, yes, <laughs> this is a workshop that an active experimenter would love, but an abstract conceptualizer is going to be bored. And so I, that's what I do. Essentially, it's a quick and dirty way for me to hold myself accountable to make sure that I am um, doing what I know to be true and not just training people in the way I like to be trained because that's something that many of us um, fall into the habit of doing. We either train the way we were trained or we train the way we would like to be trained. And that's part of why I asked those two questions at the beginning in the polls about your self-assessment as well as what's the primary way you typically train people now. Because often the way we train people now does reflect how we learn, but it also may just be the habit or the pattern that's been established in the organization and nobody's questioned doing it differently. So I just make sure that whatever I look at is I'm, I'm covering all the bases. Somebody's asking about time. Um, again, the time issue is really challenging because in some cases you're going to have a lot more time than you are in others. And so I just make sure that I touch each one and that I include each one as quickly as I can in the beginning. So we've advanced um, slides. I'm just going to take take a second and go back. I just want you to see this, this particular quote um, because I think it really underscores one of the key messages here which is it's not so much which learning style you are or which learning style each of the people you're training is. It's really that until you learn in more than one way, until they learn in more than one way, they really haven't grasped the whole and they're not necessarily going to retain it as well. So Mary, I think we're coming up on the end of the time we have. We are. We are narrowing down on our time. And I want to thank um, Pat for sure for coming. <laughs>